So now we have to go through this prolonged period of reform, 1978 to 2013, where we open up China. And there are five major initiatives that powered China's growth. First, they privatized. Okay? So the first person who got the opportunity to market their wares were actually the farmers. The government said, look, once you fulfill your national quota, you can go out and sell your stuff in a marketplace. And so in 1980, 3% of workers worked in private industry. Today, 80% of workers work in private industry. So there's a lot of chat about China being state run, but at this point, it's really market run. Second thing they did was industrialize. And so manufacturing output, in, you know, the US has dominated for a long period of time. Well, China opened up some special zones and basically said, international manufacturing companies will make you a deal. You can come in and have access to our cheap workers and we'll use you for job training. Well, that was very effective, as you can see. And so the share of global manufacturing has uh, gotten to the point where China is by far the most dominant manufacturer on the planet. Well, if you're going to manufacture a lot of goods, you need a lot of boats. And so they went to commercialize. They actually built the biggest ship on the planet, I think, not, re not too long ago. That may be a picture of it, actually. Anyway, so China is now the number one largest exporter on the globe and took market share, obviously, from Japan, Germany, and the US. And if you're going to industrialize, you need to urbanize. You need to put the people close to the factories. And the migration, the urbanization that's occurred in China has been historic. In fact, there were 200 million people or less in cities in 1980. And today, there's 750. That's 55% of the population. The government wants to see that at 75% by 2020. And by some measures, there could be another 500 million people in cities by 2030. Now, how quick is that? Well, it, basically their plan is to go from 51% to 70%. That'll take 19 years. It took us 50 years to do it, and we have a fifth of their population. Astounding. Well, you got all these goods and services, you got all these people, you need transportation. Um, I'm jealous of their transportation network. We have an office in Nashville as well. Uh, High-speed rail would be fantastic. In China, we'd have one. Length of railways have basically gone up in the last seven years or so by whatever that is, 40,000 kilometers. Length of expressways have gone up, whatever that is, 80, 70,000 kilometers. Airports, they built 100 of them in a few years, and they've doubled their, Richard, you could explain this, I have no idea what that says, but from container terminals, they have more than they used to. So a lot of capacity being built in China to modernize and network and put it all together, what do you get? You get a growth rate over 10% for more than 30 years. Uh, the GDP in China is now 33 times what it was in 1980. Congratulations, Comrade Ding. So applause to that guy. So where that puts you in absolute terms, depending on how you measure it, the Chinese economy is either number one or number two in terms of absolute size. Um, but if, if you look at Per capita GDP, China ranks 82nd on the planet, just a little bit ahead of the Maldives, right? So there's still plenty of growth to go in China to catch up in terms of the household wealth we see here, which is good news for all of us because as grows China, so grows the world economy. This goes back and says what percentage of growth over the last 12, 10 years can be explained by China's growth rate? In the 2012, it was 20%. It's now up to 30%. So China grows. Good news for them. Good news for us. Uh-oh. Something happened in 2008. The Americans surprised the Chinese by having a great big financial crisis. And that ended up being a very, very disorienting event in China because the Chinese economy had really calibrated to the U.S. consumer. The collapse of the U.S. consumer meant the collapse of the Chinese economy. So if you look at nominal GDP growth, China got cut in half between 2008 and 2010, per se. And so they launched the biggest shovel-ready stimulus package on the planet, and they financed it through bank credit. So they extended a bunch of loans, and they revived GDP. Congratulations, it worked out great. But something changed. The amount of credit they're pumping into the system and the amount of GDP that it generates has been diminishing. 
And that has caused many on the globe to worry that perhaps China has entered a bubble. So is China in a bubble? Well, let's take two different looks at it. First, here's absolute debt in China relative to GDP. So China's currently, when you combine corporate, household, and government debt, running at about 200 and change percent of GDP. That's a lot, but it's less than what we've got in the U.S. at about 250 percent and far less than Japan at 400 percent. So from an absolute standpoint, I do not think that a credit crisis is imminent in Japan. But what about all these ghost cities? I, I remember that 60 Minutes show that you all must have watched about the ghost cities in China because I got 100 emails about it. Cities falling down and shopping malls and nobody in them. Well, here's the thing. They urbanize 20 million people a year, right? Imagine trying to perfectly calibrate supply with that much demand. So there are going to be periods of oversupply. There are going to be periods of undersupply. And if you look at it, they are in a period of oversupply right now. So what do you do about it? You cut prices and you stop fixed asset investments. That is what's happening. So in our view, we see this as more of a cyclical decline than a structural decline in terms of what's going on in the housing industry.